Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy President. I rise today to oppose the Marriage Equality Amendment Bill. As I said in a previous speech about free speech, it, it is shameful that activists for marriage equality assume that opponents must be bigots. It seems there is no free speech in this country as long as there is this concept of hate speech. Hate speech is anathema to free speech, to have attitudes and laws which are called hate speech. With this bill today, the Greens seek to jump the gun on the efforts of others to claim, in order to claim a political win for themselves. The government has agreed to a public vote on marriage. But no, the Greens don't want to wait for that. They are scared of putting the question to the people. They are scared of how the silent majority will vote when given the chance. Opinion polls, opinion polls on news websites seem enough for them. They want to rush headlong into yet another radical experiment on Australian society. Radical yet when members sought the views of their, what, yet when members sought their, oh, Mr. Ch Mr. Deputy Craig. Yes, um, e even though it's a long way away from me and I can't hear all the details of the interjections, I, I, I think senators should be more courteous when they are so close to another senator, senator speaking, and keep uh, the noise down. Senator Day, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Um, when members of parliament and senators sought the views of their own electorates in the not too distant past, the majority told them the truth. Australians do not want marriage or the word marriage to be redefined. And on the question of a public vote, you just have to ask how it can be a fair debate when you have a barrage of unfounded claims thrown at you the minute you open your mouth saying you support keeping the status quo, keeping the definition of marriage as it is. You also have to ask how it will be a fair debate when you look at who is lining up on the yes case. But no, the Greens don't want to wait for any of that to materialise. They're just like the chant of the students and socialists who chant, what do we want? Gay marriage. When do we want it? Now. Name-calling and sloganeering and empty platitudes are unbecoming and facile. Take, for example, the phrase itself, marriage equality. By calling same-sex unions marriage, it is asserted by stealth that they, are already, that they already qualify as marriage. This is before any supporting arguments have even been offered. And saying it's a matter of equality evokes the struggle of the suffragette or Martin Luther King. And if you dare oppose that, you don't have a dip or you don't have a difference of opinion according to the gatekeepers of tolerance. You're just plain wrong. End of story. And while this might be very effective rhetoric, it tells us nothing about what marriage actually is or why different treatment is automatically bigoted. It is ironic that those who cry bigot are guilty of bigotry themselves. When people advocating traditional marriage are dismissed out of hand or when their motives are treated with suspicion and malice, that is prejudice. That is bigotry. Like when Archbishop Porteous, you know, subject to, subjected to complaints, complaints that cost the alleged victim nothing but merely completing a form, but cost the accused everything. Bigotry gains an ally on its side, the guerrilla of state apparatus to suppress dissent and the expression of millennial values. A civil debate on marriage would focus on the key principles of what is marriage. 
And why does it matter what it is? What sort of relationship is marriage or is a marriage? Should the state define a marriage? And if so, why? What role does the state have in this institution of marriage? Marriage is the foundation of society's most fundamental unit, the family. Marriage is itself a social good, worthy of protection by law. Marriage provides the best environment for the family to flourish and for children to be raised and nurtured. It is this critical function of marriage in our society that allows the state to take an interest in its regulation. I'll repeat that. It is this critical function, the function that, that allows marriage to provide the best environment for the family to flourish and for children to be raised and nurtured, it is that critical function that allows the state to take an interest in its regulation. Normally the state would not regulate relationships between adults. It is only because marriage has a position as a foundational building block of society that marriage is an exception to that rule. Out of the thousand plus societies recorded in Murdoch's ethnographic atlas, marriage between one man and one woman is common in all. Whilst the marriage of men to multiple wives is prevalent in over 800. By contrast, marriage between people of the same sex has never been widely accepted in any culture since the dawn of time. Here's another set of questions a civil and measured debate should consider. If this bill seeks marriage equality, what is it trying to protect equally? What relationships then are not marriage? Why would redefining marriage stop at same-sex relationships? The bill talks about two people. But why not three? The thruple concept, three people, the thruple concept advanced by the polyamory advocates goes something like this. Three people of any gender can be married to one another. They will make all the claims of emotional union, romantic feelings, pledges to care for one another, etc. How soon until we have marriage equality dusted off for the thruples? I suggest that there won't even be enough time for the dust to settle and it will be on again. If you don't believe me, I note that the Greens cousins in the UK are right now advocating for consenting polyamorous relationships. Absolutely. The goal of this push is to have, in a borrowed phrase, marriage equality. A recent Canadian court has made the argument that three people in a loving relationship aren't harming anyone, so why not give them marriage too? Given the demographic rise in Australia of people from cultures like those in the, in the Middle East, where there is polygamy, you can safely assume there will be a marriage equality push for them sometime soon. But why stop even there? In places where gay people, typically, typically men, have been able to form recognised unions they don't necessarily equate their commitment to monogamy. The term monogamish, well, monogamy is kind of monogamish, has now been coined a sort of open marriage, a tautology if ever I heard one in this brave new world. As they feel a restriction to one partner is unrealistic and natural. A three-year study of civil unions in Vermont in the USA found that 15 per cent of straight married men had sex outside their relationships, compared to 58 per cent of gay men in civil unions. Other studies have reported candid admissions from many gay couples about monogamy. Despite their intention to stay faithful, a survey found that only seven out of 156 same-sex couples 
had managed to do so. This monogamish compromise is nothing short of surrender. As usual, all the guarantees about marriage staying the same have come to naught. Speaking on a panel of homosexual authors at the 2012 Sydney Writers' Festival, Dennis Altman said this, and I quote, Now I'm going to speak now as a gay man. One of the things about gay male culture is that it is not a monogamous, monogamous culture. All the evidence we have suggests that monogamy is a myth. There are many long-standing gay relationships. There are virtually no long-standing monogamous gay relationships. Now, let me pause here for a minute. I'm fortunate that I can say these things under parliamentary privilege. But could I say them outside? With the persecution of Archbishop Porteous, I'm not so sure. But I digress. Let's shift to the question of children. Children deserve a mother and a father. They need both. We're not talking here about only redefining marriage. We're talking about redefining the words mother and father. Already birth certificates around the country are being written to say parent one and parent two, right here in the ACT, or more. There is no such thing, there's no such thing as parenting. There is only mothering and fathering. And children need both, a mother and a father. Whenever a child is born, the mother will obviously be close by, and fathers should be close by as well. The two of them take responsibility to raise that child. And when that doesn't happen, the social costs for the spouses in particular, and for the child and for society are very, very high. Katie Faust. A recent visitor and speaker in Australia told her own story of being raised by lesbian mothers. She spoke of the loving and caring nature of their parenting, but emphasised that neither were a substitute for a father she desperately needed in her life. This echoes the sentiments of another child of gay parents, Heather Barwick. In a speech delivered last year, Heather Barwick said, and I quote, same-sex marriage and parenting withholds either a mother Order. or father Senator, from a... Senator, the time for this debate has now expired.